What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Today, we're gonna be recapping the 2019 Tesla shareholder meeting. I just got back from Silicon Valley, had an amazing time at the event, met so many cool people, saw the, the semi-truck in person, the new all red Model Y, even saw the Roadster, even got a little footage of that, driving around, um, had so much fun. So in this episode, I'm gonna give a brief analysis and recap of what happened in the meeting, my takeaways, some tidbits that I got from reading in between the lines about comments, and then at the end, um, sort of a bold prediction about Tesla's battery technology, what they're going to do announce at their battery investor day, which is coming up. And I, I, I've just been putting the pieces together on what I think the market, Wall Street um, and investors, n almost nobody understands a huge puzzle piece that's going on on the back end of Tesla's supply chain that is going to have a huge impact on potentially uh, advancing their battery uh, uh, technology in a significant way. So anyway, we're going to get all in, in, in all of that in this episode. Let's get right into it with a recap of the shareholder meeting. So the shareholder meeting, anybody that's a shareholder can go. Um, I got there at like noon or 1230. There was always a already a ton of people in line. Um, I, I feel like the, the shareholder meeting gets more and more popular each year. Anyway, you go into this auditorium. The first thing that happens is it's pretty like formal. Like you see a presentation from the lawyers, the board of directors, they have to reelect officials. There's sort of this archaic voting process that's really boring that nobody is there for. But anyway, that's how the meeting starts. And then Elon Musk goes on stage and, and begins his presentation. So um, Elon Musk starts out by describing Model 3 market share data. So the Model 3, um, the last four quarters in the US is the best selling car by revenue. Um, and I know a lot of you know this and may have seen these slides, but I just think it's worth mentioning because not is not only is the Tesla outselling the Camry, the Accord, the Civic, I mean, this is an electric car that is the best selling vehicle in the United States. If you're an electric vehicle tree hugger like myself, who is rooting for this green future, who's rooting for the revolution, I mean, to see the Tesla Model 3 as the best selling car by revenue in the US and a purely electric vehicle, not even a hybrid, is, is unbelievable. This is why I think the Model 3 is one of the best product launches in automotive history. In just two years, we're scaling from the production of zero cars to almost 250,000 units. It took Toyota 10 years to scale the production of the Prius to the same level. So that just gives you, you know, a flavor of how impressive the market share and ramp has been of this Tesla Model 3. The other thing is they, they talk about the efficiency of their cars, which are the industry's best. And this is on an EPA miles per kilowatt hour basis. And this is a great way to sum up the technology that Tesla has and its lead over the competitors in electric drivetrains and batteries. That means that they can produce cheaper electric cars with a longer range for you. And I just think it's so funny how a lot of critics say, you know, the competition coming, you know, all these other legacy auto companies are gonna be able to crush and compete with Tesla. And then you look at the specs and, and the specs and the data is clearly showing that Tesla is far better at, at producing much superior and far more advanced electric vehicle and battery technology than any of these legacy auto OEMs. So I think that's a good thing. And that efficiency edge is something that I'm watching very, very closely. I think is key to Tesla's competitive advantage. And the other thing that, that is another data point that shows that Tesla's technology is so much further ahead is the range of their cars. I mean, nobody's put out an electric vehicle with more than 300 miles of range. I mean, this is unbelievable. Nobody has matched the, the long range Model S from 2012 in terms of performance. And, and now Tesla keeps improving. So you can see those three blue lines there, the new Model S with 370 miles of range. Elon even says in the presentation that a 400 mile range EV could be right around the corner. I think that could mean an SNX refresh is happening when that happens with some new technology that we're gonna get into in a second. We could be looking at 400 plus mile range EVs. So I mean, when, when, when you think about Tesla, I always say they're not really competing with other electric cars because they're so far behind in the technology. They're competing with, you know, the 85 million, 90 million internal combustion engine vehicles sold each year. And that's why Tesla improving the range, improving the specs relative to the other internal combustion engine cars is going to mean huge things for their sales and overall the adoption of electric vehicles. This was a potentially, I mean, a huge bright spot and relief off my shoulder as much as I try not to be a quarter to quarter person and, and think, really think about the long term. I mean, there's been huge concerns in the media about Tesla's demand cliff and, and nobody wanting their cars. But, you know, Tesla reiterated that they're on track for close to a record quarter. Um, that would be over 91, about 91,000 deliveries. They say uh, quarter to date orders for Model S, X, and 3 are outpacing production. I think that's a really good clue that the Project Raven upgrade of the S and X was leading to a bump in sales there, which should be really good for the Q2 numbers. I mean, my model says that if Tesla delivers 90 to 91,000 cars this quarter, we could see positive operating income. I mean, the last time they delivered 90,000 cars in Q3, we saw them post 400 million operating income, over a billion in operating cash flow. Sure, the prices were higher. They were selling the performance model three, but since then production costs have come down, the mix is stabilized. So I think it's possible that if Tesla does hit these production, you know, their stretch goal right now, about 91,000 or, or over that, we could actually see a profitable quarter, which would be a huge, huge surprise. So I think that's really exciting stuff. And Elon Musk even did hint and said something really, really interesting. We have a decent shot at a record quarter. 
um, on every level. Um, so I don't know if he was implying just production or deliveries or profitability or cash flow, but I think that is a really, really interesting statement. Then they do a quick analysis of the trade-ins of the Model 3, and you can see that there's 63% of them are non-premium vehicles. I just wanted to, I know you guys probably know this, um, I just wanted to mention this really quickly because this shows the Tesla stretch. First of all, people are willing to pay up for their Teslas because they love the product. They'll, they'll, they want to pay more than, than they have for any other vehicle in the past because they're getting more joy out of it. It's a better product. So there's a Tesla stretch where people are actually paying more for vehicles when it's a Tesla because the product is that much better. The other thing that's going on here is the total cost of ownership of a Tesla of a Model 3 is actually closer to the Camry or Accord than it is to many of these Audi A4, you know, Mercedes E C-Class competitors. And that is because of the maintenance and operational savings over time. So you're saving a ton of money on gas over time, a ton of money on maintenance and fixing and servicing your car over time. And this, this means, you know, although the sticker price for the Model 3 is much higher, it's actually comparable to these cars like the Camry and Accord, which it's outselling on a revenue basis. And I think consumers are doing the math and it's resonating with them. And, and that is why we're seeing the, so many non-premium vehicles being traded in for Teslas. Elon briefly mentions the Model Y saying that the addressable market for the compact SUV segment is about two and a half times bigger than the Model 3. So he thinks that the Model Y could outsell the Model S, X, and 3 combined in terms of units. I mean, if you start to think about the excitement of Tesla's business model, they already have the stores, they already have the superchargers, they already have the service networks. You start adding more cars, you know, and they have the same R and D or a relatively stable R and D and operational costs, you're looking at that incremental gross profit from every new vehicle, you know, more and more of it going right to the bottom line. So when I think about the Model Y, I'm thinking this is a huge driver of operating cash flow and of earnings for the company way beyond revenue growth. And so I'm really, really excited about that. And they are planning to start production of that in volume production in fall 2020. And Jay Filchi, shout out to Julian, he, who's my buddy, he was sitting next to me at the Tesla shareholder meeting. He was, we were in the third row, first row. I was like four feet away from Larry Ellison, Jurvetson, Robin Denholm, and it, Julian, I didn't see this, but he said that there was like an interesting wink um, or sort of like kind of like smile at, uh, that went on at the board of director level when they met, mentioned this target and when Elon specifically said that they would be actually internally targeting volume production even sooner from that. I love this. My last question at the last year's shareholder meeting was all about sandbagging. You know, how do we, how are we supposed to trust you, Elon? How are we supposed to trust you, Tesla, if all these targets, 500,000 Model 3s, this, you know, you're, you're missing every single goal. And so I, and I think the tone of Tesla, at least in this shareholder meeting, changed. I'm a huge, huge fan of that. They're under-promising, setting up for over-delivering. And I think that is exactly what you need to do to be managing expectations in the market. That's what I see them doing with the Model Y. And that's what I saw, saw them doing throughout the shareholder meeting. Like, there was no huge promises or crazy claims. And I think that, over the long run, is really going to play into Tesla's favor. And it shows that the company's communication strategy is improving dramatically. I love it. Awesome job, Tesla. They mentioned Gigafactory 1. He brings up JB on stage. And... It's this is a really funny story, and I wanted to mention this because you know the capacity of Gigafactory One when they planned it, 35 gigawatt hours of batteries was more than the entire world's battery production combined just a couple of years before, and so that goes to show you the scope of what Tesla is doing. I mean, to, the, the amount of batteries in your car are so much more than your laptop or cell phone that takes way less cars to use an absurdly amount more batteries. And so what's so interesting here is when people talk about the threat of other EVs and of all these other auto manufacturers, you know, this is the problem that they're all going to run into, and this is why. Tesla had to vertically integrate. Everyone thought this was a moronic idea at the time, but it's proving out to be strategically brilliant. And I'm going to touch on this more later. But the, the fact is that Tesla needed so many batteries to be pumping out hundreds of thousands of electric vehicles for a year. They had to build a battery factory from scratch. And now they have ramped it to over 20 gigawatt hours of output and it continues to climb. So this is to me a testament of the biggest bottleneck that every other electric vehicle competitor will face is figuring out how to get their hands on enough batteries. If you look at the production schedule for the, the iPACE, which just got recalled, the Etron, which just got recalled, the Porsche Taycan, you know, all of these cars are saying, oh, we're going to produce like 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. And they're kind of capped out at that because they don't have the battery capacity. I mean, that's why these are not serious competitors to Tesla, because none of these car companies are taking the steps required to invest billions of dollars in the battery manufacturing infrastructure to be able to pump out hundreds of thousands of cars per year. And that's why I just think these other EV competitors are a joke for now until we see them put up this kind of capital for their battery infrastructure. They touch on the, the Gigafactory Shanghai, the shell of the building is complete. They're still targeting end of 2019 for vehicle production here. I mean, this is a huge, huge deal. It's it's the world's largest EV market. I mean, there, there's just the, you know, I've been to China a couple of times and I will say the infrastructure there, the pace of construction, just the way they just 
excuse my French, but get shit done is incredible. And and that is why, you know, I wasn't really surprised when to see this Tesla factory spring up like this. And you think about it from the government standpoint, of course, they want to help Tesla. They're on Tesla's side here. I mean, this is the first uh, foreign owned auto factory to be built in China. This is a historic milestone for global trade and globalization that nobody is talking about that Tesla's leading the way. It wasn't GM, Ford, Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW that got the first wholly owned factory in China. No, it was Tesla because they have the best EV and battery technology. And that's where the future is headed and China knows it. And that's why China is pumping, is, is pushing so hard on this gigafactory. And so I think this is a hugely exciting catalyst that we're going to see later in 2019 and early 2020, where Tesla really starts to grow in the Chinese market. They also do a little joke and mention Gigafactory Europe. So the company is scouting locations for another gigafactory, Gigafactory 4 in Europe. Uh, not too many details on that, but, but I think it is interesting that, you know, Elon Musk has said they want to have production on basically every single continent uh, to minimize the amount of time that it takes takes to actually get the order from the customer and get paid from the customer to get being, being paid for suppliers. And he actually mentions a really interesting tidbit here about the cash flow cadence. There's way stronger cash flow for Tesla's US sales because they're actually getting paid by customers faster than they need to pay suppliers. So they're actually getting paid to build these cars up front. They're positive float, um, which is a really fascinating you know dynamic in the business. But when you're shipping cars to China and Europe, Tesla's got to pay for all those parts and supplies ahead of time, and then they get paid. So it's a huge drag on cash flow. So that gave me some key clarity about why there was such weak numbers in Q1 because they had that huge cash flow drag. But as they set up gigafactories in Europe and China, we're going to see that same sort of float phenomena that is occurring in the US occur glo globally for Tesla that will totally augment the cash flow profile of the company. They talk about Tesla Energy 2x storage growth compared to 2018. They also talk about the solar roof, which is being installed in eight states. Um, they mentioned that they're on version three of this, still working very, very hard to push this out. I know so many people are skeptical and have been hating on the solar roof, but this is what I love about Tesla. As fast as they're moving at the pace of innovation of all the stuff they're doing, they also take the time to perfect the product, to make sure it's right, to make sure when you get this product, which has a 30 year, you know, some huge warranty that it actually makes you happy for the life of the product. And I think that is so important. That long-term thinking about putting customers first is always going to be Tesla's priority. And that's been the major delay of the solar roof, but I think it's still coming and it's still going to be there. And the, the battery business, so they brought up JB Straubel, the CTO of Tesla, they brought up this guy called Drew, who is a VP of technology at Tesla, been working there for 14 years. A lot of rumors have been happening that JB Straubel is sort of working less at the company. A ton of people have told me this, and I've been hearing it from a lot of different sources. JB Straubel also selling some equity in Tesla. And so many people are sort of speculating that there's like a soft retirement occurring with JB and this guy Drew could potentially replace him. Or that was sort of my gut instinct is I think Drew will eventually be replacing JB as the CTO of Tesla. I know some of my Tesla Q people are going to be like, oh my God, the CTO is leaving. It's like, dude, he worked there for 15 years. He's retiring. He laid in the groundwork. He's been mentoring the same guy for 14 years. Who's going to take over? I mean, that's just going to be another example. Watch how that plays out in the press when this gets announced of how Tesla Q and the financial media just twist the narrative of Tesla, makes every single piece of news sound like the end of the world when it's really just business as usual. They talk about the supercharger network, uh, you know, V3, you can get 75 miles of charge in five minutes. I mean, this to me is an unbelievable moat for Tesla. And I know Elon Musk hates moats, but I frankly think, you know, Elon Musk says that service centers and charging stations where they have really adequate of, of both of those is where their sales are strong. You know, that's what consumers are thinking about. It's a huge purchase to buy a car. They're very smart about thinking about, you know, where am I going to get this service? How am I going to charge for long distance? And that's why the supercharger network is so important. And that's why I also just tweeted today that I think Rivian should be calling up Elon Musk and Tesla as fast as possible to try and get access to this charging network because I think every single electric vehicle that doesn't have, you know, a worldwide or, or you know, regional like very well thought out and planned charging infrastructure is going to have a really, really tough time selling their cars to average people other than just the super rich niche. So anyway, I just, I, I, it just reiterated to me of Tesla once again, just like the Gigafactory, you know, this crazy idea to spend millions and billions of dollars up front to build out this infrastructure that nobody understood is now, you know, years later becoming a critical competitive advantage uh, for the company. What's so fascinating and amazing about Tesla is once again, pace of innovation. I mean, they had V1, V2, and now they're V3. They're con it's not even like they built the supercharger network and they're letting it stay stagnant. They're constantly adding new locations and upgrading the technology so that your car charges faster. Because once again, the competition is not the other electric vehicles who they're crushing in sales, but it's the internal combustion engine. And that is why they need to keep improving the charge speed of the supercharger network and its ubiquity because it needs to be rivaling that of gas stations. And then they talk about the unmatched product lineup. I love this about Tesla. I mean, 
the Model Y, the, the Tesla pickup truck, Cyberpunk, and the semi-truck. Huge, huge stuff in the works for Tesla. They also mentioned a little tidbit here that I haven't seen many people talk about, the semi-production to start sometime late next year, late 2020, which is about a year later than originally planned. And, and why? Why is Tesla kind of pushing down the semi down the road and, and moving up the Model Y? It's all about battery cells and battery production. They want to maximize their use of batteries in terms of revenue and cash flow and disruption, and they can use way less batteries per Model Y than per semi, and they're therefore they can sell a lot more Model Ys with a much smaller amount of battery production relative to the semi, which needs a huge, huge battery pack. And so that is that what I started to take away here, is the biggest constraint that Tesla has is ramping battery production. And then they talk about the battery investor day that's coming up and how they have, you know, they don't want to get the cat out of the bag too much, but there's a bunch of exciting disruptive innovations they're going to be announcing at their battery and powertrain investor day. We're matching the uh, the product rollout according to the uh, scaling of, of battery production. Um, that's really the, the main limiting factor. And then as we, as we scale battery production to very high levels, we actually have to look further down the supply chain. We, we, we might get into the mining business, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe a, you know, a little bit at least. But we'll do whatever we have to to ensure that we can scale uh, at the fastest rate possible. To this point, we are going to have a battery and powertrain investor day uh, that uh, hopefully this summer, um, before the end of the year for sure. Because um, I think we, this is a <laughs> big deal. You guys want to say anything about that? Or we don't let the cat out of the bag too much, but you know, still in the bag. I mean, I, I think it's right on. I mean, those are yeah. exactly the right problems that we need to solve to scale, and they have they have been for some time. But it's more obvious now than I think it ever was that uh, we we need a large scale solution to cell production. Yes, and get the cost per kilowatt hour lower, and energy density higher. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and we're not sitting. Yeah, we're not sitting idly by. We're taking all the moves required to be masters of our own destiny here, uh, technologically and otherwise. And I, I think, you know, through through all the uh, experience we've developed with partners and otherwise, uh, we we have a we will we have solutions in place. And this is at the part of the shareholder meeting. They're basically saying like, okay, our biggest problem is expanding battery cell production. Uh, we're working on this and thinking about it, but we're not really going to say why or what or how. I yelled out Maxwell. I only yelled out one thing during the meeting because I don't want to be rude. And then actually you can see, you can't hear me say Maxwell on the live stream, but you can see Elon make a funny face. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> And then they actually, the next question that say, from Say was about Maxwell and they don't want to talk about it. And anyway, tying this all together, here is my theory. Tesla is, they want to be masters of their own destiny. Up until now, at the, at the Gigafactory in Nevada, they've had a partnership with Panasonic where Tesla, Panasonic actually builds the cells, the little cylindrical things in the battery. And then Tesla assembles all these cells into the battery pack and actually manufactures the entire pack and drivetrain. But like Tesla said, they're mining. They want to get into mining. They want to get in vertically integrated. They want to, they even mention they want to talk, get a large scale solution to sell production. So to me, what that means is, that, and we've seen a bunch of stuff in the media about them sort of leaving Panasonic and that relationship fraying, interestingly timed with when they're ramping up a, a beta cell line with Maxwell, who then they acquired. Anyway, long story short here is they acquired Maxwell Technologies. That acquisition is cl closed. I made a ton of videos about it. I've got a couple hundred thousand views and there's huge interest in it because because it is the biggest fundamental change in Tesla's battery supply chain that has happened since the launch of the Gigafactory. And that is Tesla is, this is my prediction at least, this is the bomb I wanted to drop. And, and I could be totally wrong, but I believe Tesla at their battery investor day is about to announce that with the acquisition of Maxwell, they are going to start beginning to manufacture their own battery cells. This will unlock the biggest bottleneck for Tesla's business, which is the supply of advanced lithium ion battery cells, which previously they'd been relying on Panasonic for, but now they will be doing Doing themselves. Why does this make sense? Why is this such a big deal? Because in my head, I had them continuing to expand with Panasonic with a certain trajectory of technological improvements in terms of efficiency and range and cost of the batteries. Well, Maxwell has come up with this dry battery electrode breakthrough, which allows for no toxic solvent, no drying ovens, essentially a much faster time to produce battery cells that are far more efficient and far more sustainable. This means this technology essentially leapfrogs what Panasonic has been doing for Tesla. So if you're in Tesla's shoes here, they've 
had Panasonic in the Nevada Gigafactory, my guess is they've learned everything about building battery cells from Panasonic. And, and if you read the Maxwell, the, what sort of between the lines was happening there, Tesla basically brought in their own battery chemistry. This is my understanding to Maxwell, tested it up, ramped it up, scaled it, actually built new cells with Maxwell technology. This isn't vaporware. They did it and they tested it. And then after validating that breakthrough, Tesla was like, we can build our own battery cells. So this to me lines up perfectly. And why is this such a big deal? Because this means that if the cost trajectory was like this and the efficiency trajectory was like this, I think Maxwell just leapfrogged it. And they just leapfrogged both the cost trajectory and the efficiency trajectory that was on track with Panasonic. And if you think about what is the most, the biggest moat that Tesla has, I'll pull up Matt Joyce's efficiency chart here. It is the combination of, of being having the best batteries, the most efficient batteries, the most efficient drivetrain at the lowest cost. That is Tesla's moat. That is the most important thing to, to to launching a, a compelling mass market electric vehicle is to have a car that can go as far as an ICE car, that can charge really quickly, that has a battery that is super reliable, that lasts a long time. Those are the most important things. That is what will improve dramatically with the Maxwell technology acquisition. So there's a little bit of a rant, but my point here is, my prediction is that when Tesla has their battery and powertrain investor day, they will announce they are beginning to start cell production and building their own cells. These much more advanced cells will enable the, the range of Tesla's vehicles of like the Model S, maybe even the Model 3 to hit 400 plus miles of range to charge faster, to have a battery that lasts much longer. I mean, if you're a consumer and and, and Tesla, you know, we have, we're looking at the I-Pace, the Taycan, all these cars coming out that it, it can't even keep up with the specs Tesla has today. You know, they're talking about 280, 240 miles of range when the Model S has 370 and that 370 Model S, I, at least in my understanding, doesn't even have these new, this new cell technology that Tesla will produce. So Tesla, in essence, has already locked up the future generation of the next great battery technology, and it's only a matter of time before this gets commercialized and integrated into their product line, resulting in vastly better uh, electric vehicles, and not only electric vehicles, but actually power packs and power walls are going to be able to leverage this Maxwell technology to get far more efficient as well. And actually, shout out to a hyperchanger who emailed me this about ultra capacitors being used to rapidly discharge and charge for the major power wall and, and uh, mega pack and power pack business could also be a way to further enhance that product line. So anyway, to sum it up, Tesla has already secured one of the world's greatest battery breakthroughs that Maxwell Technology did. Dry Battery Electrode is on the cusp of commercializing it, and this will have material impacts on the most critical part of their moat, which is battery cost and efficiency. This is a huge deal. Nobody's talking about it. One of the last things that happened during the meeting, uh, during the Q&A, which I thought was a really interesting moment for me, at least, was, was this question about the media, the FUD, um, basically this, this sentiment in the room where, you know, t us customers and like fans and investors in the company are so frustrated because it's been amazing to watch Tesla succeed on their vision to transition the world to electric vehicles, to have the best selling car by revenue. I mean, this is one of the greatest American success stories ever in terms of capitalism and inspiring people to build a sustainable future for an amazing technology company against all odds, built from scratch, made in America, employing 40,000 people. I mean, this is an incredible story. It's an amazing story of positivity, of optimism, of hope for the future, and nobody gets it. And there's a huge, I, I was on Yahoo yesterday saying there's, I've never seen a bigger disconnect between the reality of what's happening at Tesla, the disruption they've caused, how there's, you know, trillions of dollars of the fossil fuel industry on the on their back feet trying to copy Tesla's business model as fast as they can because they have validated this technology that is the biggest disruption in, in the transport industry industry we've seen for decades, you know, battery electric vehicles and autonomy. They've it's it's mind blowing what Tesla's achieved and yet the narrative is so far from that. So I, I don't have an answer and nobody at the shareholder meeting really had an answer of how we can stop this other than just keep spreading the truth and but it i thought it was just a really like i don't know how to say it, i mean like a sort of a feel-good moment or like a moment of understanding and connection between the tesla shareholder community and i just felt it was very powerful and i just think there's it's just it kind of makes me sad that there's a gap in the understanding but i also think that it's something that's going to overcome and the truth will will really win out and so i think that was sort of inspiring and you know to end the, to end the note like you know I, I had so much fun at the shareholder meeting. I met so many cool people and just like the Tesla community, so positive, so optimistic. Like, 
it, it, it was just a blast to meet all these like-minded people in person. I have a ton of shout outs to give. So I have to give a first shout out to Soph, who uh, took out his, had his performance model three there, but, uh, was driving us around in it and like was just awesome. And he also does, uh, has given like 500 Uber and Lyft rides to random people in his performance model three, just to like show them and talk about Tesla and like, like show them the launch mode and like drive it fast and like educate them about it. And I was like, man, like you're on the ground doing the hard work. That's what we need to change the narrative. That's what we need to tell people the truth is just get the butts in the seats, you know, dr you know, and anyway, so huge shout out to Soph for, for like letting us check out his model three and doing the Uber and Lyft stuff and spreading the mission about Tesla. That's amazing. Um, I got to give a shout out to the entire third row Tesla squad that was with me. You know, I met so many cool people, Vincent, Kristen, Viv, uh, the Steve Jobs dude, Tesla Raj, Tesla Loop, all these people, I'm probably missing some people that I, sh I should shout out, but um, I just had such a fun time. So anyway, that sums up my recap of the Tesla 2019 shareholder meeting. My biggest takeaway is that the business is on track. Um, Tesla is dominating the electric vehicle niche. There is a huge breakthrough in their battery technology that is going to get announced at the investor day that Wall Street, that the market, that the electric vehicles competitors do not appreciate. They do not get how big of an impact this is going to have on Tesla's product lineup and the specs. And I am so, so excited about the future of this company. So proud to be a shareholder. Um, would love to know what you guys all think in the comments below. Is there any tidbits I missed? Um, you know, what did you think about the meeting? Huge shout out to all the supporters, Patreons, producers, fun in the channel. Thank you so much. Um, this is Hyperchange. I'll see you guys next time. Have a good day. Peace.